11, verse 23. Let's start in verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night that which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. I'm going to stop it right there. I guess one of the most first things that I understood or did when I became born again, when I got saved, was the communion table, which we see in many of the churches. Commonly given once a month, maybe once every two weeks, or whatever the case may be. Normally it's once a month. People gather, and they take, uh, sometimes they take uh, crackers, normally it's crackers and grape juice. And they normally will read these passages of Scripture in remembrance of the Lord's death. And uh, uh, one, one day, and I've been in the ministry now, I would say, for about 15 years. When I first started out in ministry, we, uh, we, were, uh, we were gathered together in, uh, in Ozone Park at that time. This is when I first got started. And we were going to have the regular communion, communion table, the communion supper. Some of you were with us when, when we did it. And uh, this was back in Ozone Park, again, about 15 years ago. And, uh, you know, we're going to have the common communion table, the, you know, the usual understanding of it, just like what I read here. I read the passage of the scripture we just read. And, of course, we we're going to take the crackers and the grape juice. One time I was in a service where they actually served us wine. They actually passed wine around uh, in a born-again Pentecostal church, no less. And I, I, I thought it was grape juice. I, they, they, gave, they passed the cup around. I took a swig. Man, it was real wine, man. I, my head went, went, went north, man, I tell you. Because uh, I ain't used to wine at all, you know. So, you know. But anyhow, there it was, you know, because we've been raised up on it. I've been, I've been born again now for about 25, I've been saved now for about 25 years. And again, attended a Pentecostal church. And again, it was common for once a month to have the communion table, and that's the way we taught us. And I figured that it was, you know, it was decent and it was good and it's something to remember the Lord's death and remember the Lord's crucifixion and what he did for us and to meditate upon those things as we partake of the grape juice and the cracker. And uh, we were on Ozone Park, and I was reading the passage of Scripture, and I, I you know, was about to hand out the, the crackers and the grape juice like we normally do. And the Holy Spirit stopped me. I'll never forget this. He stopped me like I could not move. He stopped me. And he said to me, what are you doing? I said, well, we're having a communion table. We're having a communion supper. I mean, we're doing it, you know, according to the word of God. And we're going to be passing these things out in remembrance of what you've done for us. And, and you know, we're going to be just, uh, you know, praying for the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us. And I thought it was, I thought it was rather good. And I, again, I'm beginning to hand it out. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me again. What are you doing? And I, I gave the Lord the same answer. I said, well, you know, we're, we're having the communion table. I mean, you know, this is what all saved, born-again Pentecostal people do, you know. I mean, this is, a, this is, this is like, a, you know, like a holy tradition. And again, we started to pass it out. I started to pass more. And it's like the Holy Spirit it's again said to me a third time, what are you doing? Just like that. You know, like, what are you doing? Do you know what you're doing? Do you understand what you're doing? I mean, what is this with this, this cracker and the grape juice? What are you doing? And every time I would respond to the Lord and, and make him, you know, I thought that I knew what I was doing. So, of course, when the Lord said to me, what are you doing? I would give him a proper response, thinking I knew what I was doing. <laughs> and, you know, when, 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 when God's got to speak to you the same thing three times, he really wants to get your attention about something. Especially when he says it to you three times, he really, really wants to get your attention. So I stopped. So we're going we're gonna to, again, take this down into two, into two services. And this first service, I'm just going to just bring the basic understanding out and let you understand really what, what, what the Lord's Supper is. What, what, what is the Lord's Supper? 
What is this thing that we call the communion table? Now to begin with, when we read these passages of scripture, to really understand what Paul was saying, you've got to read the entire chapter in context, which normally we don't do when we're serving the communion supper. But in order to really understand what is being said, and in order to get the drift of what God was trying to say to these people, you have to read the whole chapter in context and see exactly what he was saying. Need I need to remind you that the Corinthian church was the most carnal church that there was. Every time Paul turned around, he was having trouble with the Corinthian church. That's why he wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, If I have not love, I have not gained anything, because he was a church that really put him to the test, and he had to really, really find out and learn what love really was. And sometimes the only way you can learn love is to be with the most difficult of people in the diff most difficult of circumstances. And that's where Paul penned these words. And every time he was turning around, there was some sin going on, there was something going on, everything was going on, and constantly had to come in there, constantly had to correct them. I mean, here was the church here where they were having love affairs with their mother and their yak and their sons. Disgusting. And, and, and they were proud that they were proud to have these people in their assembly because they thought, hey, we can forgive them. Hey, we, can, we got the blood of Jesus Christ that can cleanse us from all sins. So praise the Lord. If they sin, go right ahead. You're forgiven. It doesn't matter. I mean, and, 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 then, and then it was to the Corinthian church that he, that he mentioned about the gifts of the Spirit because evidently they were, they were abusing them. They were going crazy with them. Everybody thought they were spiritual. Everybody thought they had some special gift. Everybody thought they had a word from the Lord. Everybody was prophesying. Everybody had a word of knowledge. They're all running stock wild crazy. Like you see in some of these charismatic churches. Everybody's got a word. Everybody's doing something. Somebody's dancing around. Somebody's doing this. Somebody's doing that. Everybody's floating in a gift one way or another. And nobody's being taught the word of God. Isn't it something? You go to these churches where there's so much going on, and then when you really, really want to sit down and teach the Word of God, it goes in one ear and it comes out the other. <laughs> and this was, the, this was the situation of the Corinthian church. And Paul had some difficult times with the Corinthian church. Now, when you read these passages of Scripture, like I just read, you really, again, to really get the grip of what he was saying, you really have got to start in, in verse... Uh, in verse 17, oh, well actually in verse 16, in order to grab what he's really saying, you've got to start in verse 16. So why don't we just backtrack and read from verse 16 because the, the communion table or the communion supper that is commonly read is, is, is seen in the context of what is see, being said here, okay? Now look at how he starts off in verse 16. But if any man seem to be contentious... We have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now in this, I declare to you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Let's read on. Something was going on here in their gatherings. That wasn't right. There were things that were going on in their assemblings that Paul had to come in and rebuke them. They thought they were going to doing a good thing, but now Paul comes on and says, I don't praise you for what you're doing, but now I've got to say something, and I'm going to rebuke you for what you're doing. Let's read on. For, for, by, for first of all, I mean, there was a whole lot of, a bunch of things he had to, he says, first of all, let's, let's start off with this. So he had to start off from the top. I mean, there must have been a whole bunch of stuff going on. Well, for him to say, first of all, you know that there had to be other things that were involved, and there was a whole bunch of stuff going on. He says, for first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. And first, he says, the divisions. You come together, you gather, and now there's strife, there's divisions, there's arguing, there's he speaks about contentions. Look at this in verse 19. For there must be also heresies among you, that which are approved may be made manifest. And when you come together, therefore, into one place that is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. If you just by reading these few pairs of scriptures, you begin to get just a little picture of what kind of assemblings they were having. Coming in, they were arguing. They were having contentions, there was divisions among them. One was more spiritual than the other. Fights broke out. Somebody came up with heresies and started teaching things that were not there 
And there were actually people coming into the assembly, bombed, stoned out of their minds. Drunk already, before they even got into the church. They were already drunk. Now, I've been in some services where there's been contentions and strife, but I've never been in a service where people come in drunk. I mean, really drunk. Not drunk in the spirit, but drunk. And this is what was taking place here. And Paul says, I'm getting drift to this. I said, and Paul is sitting back and said, I can't believe what I'm hearing. I just can't believe what's going on in your gatherings. And they were calling these things love feasts. Because they would come together, they would not only have their a gathering like we normally do here, in worship and in teaching the word of God and in sharing, but they would also come together and they would eat together too as well. And they normally would call them love feasts. So now they would come together, and there was arguing going around, there was no order in the place, there was contention taking place between the brethren, divisions taking place, who was agreeing with one part, who was agreeing with another part, heresies were coming in, people were coming in from all over town and just preaching anything that they wanted to preach, and people believing it, people coming off off of the street saying they were saved, saying they were born again, and coming into the, coming into the church stone drunk out of their minds. I mean, this is what he was saying. I mean, I'm not throwing anything into it. This is what he was saying. This was a real mess. He says, verse 22, What? Don't you have houses that you drink in? Or you despise the church of God? He says, Don't you have your own homes to do what you got to do in, and then you bring it into the church? He says, Don't, don't you have any privacy where you do what you got to do at home and then, and then come into the church? He says, I can't believe how you, how you people are gathering. Now, in the light of that... With the light of that, now he begins to speak about what's commonly called the Lord's Supper. And matter of fact, he quotes from when Jesus said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. What he was trying to do here, and, and what Paul was saying when you read it, in the light of everything, in the context of everything, Paul was not setting down any new institution. Because that's what the Lord's Supper is, or the communion table is, in many churches. It's like an institution. And that's what people believe that this is. This is the institution of the Lord's Supper. No, it's not. That's not what he was trying to do. He was not trying to institute the Lord's Supper here. He was not trying to bring in some new thing into the church and saying, Listen, I'm going to show you how you do it now. But the reality is, if you read it from verse 16 all the way clear through, you begin to see that Paul had to come in and remind them and say, Listen, do you really know why you're saved for? He was coming in and he was letting them remind them, please pay attention to this. He was seeking to remind them the importance of the body. The importance of the body of Christ. And he was bringing this out when Jesus did, when he had his, his Passover meal. He was bringing out the Passover meal to re let them understand and see just how important the body of Christ really is. He used the Passover meal as an instruction to teach them what the body of Christ should be like. So from the outset of these scriptures, therefore, we need to understand that he was dealing here with contentions, with disputes, and he was in no way seeking to lay down a new ceremony, a new ordinance, some new institution, or some new way of doing something that they should do this in church. He wasn't saying, listen, this is what I want you to do, Church of Corinthia, when you come together. Uh, no more contentions, no more strife. I want you to come together and I want you to take the little cup of grape juice. I want you to take the, take the bread and the crackers and I want you to remember the Lord's death. He wasn't saying that. Which that's the way it's commonly understood. But I want to say to you something again. When you read it in the light of everything, he wasn't saying that. Remember, this was a rebuke. Even when he said that in verse 24, Take Eve, this is my body. What he was really doing, he was rebuking them. He was not laying down uh, you know, some new ceremony to do. He was not laying down a, a, a teach you how to do communion service type of thing, you know? But actually, and listen to this, this was written to correct the people. It was written to correct the church because of all the garbage that was going on. And they were gathering together, and it was like they were gathering together, and they, weren't even, they acted as though they weren't even saved. 
They were coming together like, like it was a social club, never realizing the importance of the body of Christ. So Paul is seeking to make them remember just how vital their understanding was to the whole understanding of what the true body of Christ is about. So if you don't understand the body of Christ, you will not understand these passages of Scripture because that's what he was seeking to teach them. And he was using what Jesus did at the Passover meal to instruct them as to un let them understand the whole, uh, the, whole, the, the whole unfolding, the whole working of what the church is really all about. And I want to do these in these messages. Actually in the second message, because i got some things that i got to lay down for you right now. I'll let you see how the Lord opened it up to me. But please keep that in the back of your mind, that it has got to do with the whole structure of the church, and the whole structure of the body. And the whole thing of what Jesus was saying when He made His Passover meal, because that's exactly what the communion supper is to be. Because Jesus Christ did the Passover meal. It wasn't called the communion supper, and it wasn't called the Lord's supper, but rather it was called the, the, the Passover meal, which is exactly what was taking place here. But remember this, if you read it in the entire context, that again, again, it was written to correct the church. It wasn't written to teach them how to do communion service. It wasn't written to reveal to them, you know, the right way of doing it. He wasn't laying down again a new ceremony, a new ordinance, a new sacraments, a new thing to do. He wasn't doing that anyway. He was actually rebuking them. Now, to really understand, therefore, what this communion table is all about, or this communion supper is all about, the Holy Spirit ministered that there are three ways in which it's commonly, uh, three ways that I want to open up to you of how many people understand it. Okay? And the three ways that it's commonly understood, these passages of Scripture, three ways that it's commonly seen is what I call the literal accounts, the symbolic accounts, and the scriptural account. Now that's the way I'm going to open it up to you. I'm going to first of all show you what the literal account was, what the symbolic account was, and what the scriptural account was. So let's first begin with understanding what the literal account. Again, there are three ways of understanding what the Lord's Supper is. and It's commonly understood these three ways. Of course, I agree with the scriptural accounts, not the literal account or the symbolic account, but I just need to teach this to you, this way you understand it, because I think we've been fed a lot of the two, but don't realize the third, which is the real scriptural account of it. We've been familiar with the literal account and the symbolic account, but we're not familiar with the scriptural account. And again, when I was doing that communion table, I was doing it in a symbolic way, but I wasn't doing it in a scriptural way. That's why the God stopped me and said, just what are you doing? Because it may have sounded good, it may have looked good, but it wasn't scriptural. See, it was symbolic, but it ain't scriptural. I'm going to show this to you. First of all, let's lay down for us what is the literal account. The literal account comes to us from the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Which, if we've been grown up in Roman Catholicism, which I'm sure that most of us have, most of the audience that I speak to, most of the people of God that I speak to have a Roman Catholic background, so I think they're most familiar with this. What is dangerous with this, uh, with this understanding, because we've been, I know I, I, for myself, I was raised in this Roman Catholic tradition of the Holy Eucharist. And I think about 80% of the Christians that we see in America were raised up on this Roman Catholic tradition. And the danger of it is, is that we may come into the church and say we're only doing it symbolic, but the reality is, the spirit that we picked up when we were in the Roman Catholic church, we bring it right into the church. And even though we're saying, oh, we're doing it symbolic way, the reality is that spirit is still standing behind us, making us think that what the little grape juice that we're holding is actually the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. Now, what's the literal accounts? I'm teaching with the I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but that's exactly what happens. So here we are in a Pentecostal church saying, oh, it's symbolic, but we never realize the spirits that we're bringing into that whole thing because we were raised up with that thing most of our lives. And now we bring it right into the church. 
And we say, well, it's, what we do is that we just give it a facelift. That's all we do. But the devil is still a devil. Christianity, we know that Christians got together weekly in order to celebrate the uh, death and resurrection of Jesus and did this with a community meal together in which they would uh, have a kind of a potluck supper. Historians now know that the earliest places of Christian worship were in the homes of converts to the faith. For the first three centuries, Christian churches met in homes house churches. And that meant they were in the domestic sphere. By the end of the third century, worship was taken out of the home and moved to public reception halls called basilicas. Under the leadership of male priests, the meal disappears, and the elements of bread and wine become the central ritual. What you have is that authority is now becoming attached to the person who presides over Now, that. the literal account uh, uh, of, the, of the whole idea of the communion supper, it's taken again from the Roman Catholic Church with a doctrine called transubstitution. Can you say that with me? Transubstitution. Matter of fact, I think that if you speak to most Roman Catholics, they probably wouldn't even know that word. But that is the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church which instituted the teaching that the, that the priest has got the power to pull God out of heaven, to pull Christ out of heaven and put him literally and physically into that Eucharist. The, the transubstitution teaches, and transubstitution was established by the Council of Trent in 1545. And what the Council of Trent established is that, that during the s sacrifice of the Mass, the priest has got the power to literally, physically, call Christ down from heaven and place him within the Eucharist. So this way, when you eat that communion thing, that communion wafer from the priest's hand, you are actually eating physically the body of Jesus Christ. That's why they put the little plate under you. Because they don't want Jesus to fall off of your mouth, just in case, just in case it comes down. They don't want Jesus to, to hit the ground. You see? Because that's the teaching. They actually believe that the priest has got the power to actually physically, literally, pull Christ down out of heaven and put him into that Eucharist. And the whole mess is centers on that one moment when the priest lifts up the Eucharist and, and magically and supernaturally, the priest now has got the power to call Christ down into that Eucharist. So when the Roman Catholic person eats that Eucharist, in reality he's receiving Christ. That's how the Roman Catholic receives Christ. He doesn't receive him into the heart, he receives him into the mouth with the Eucharist. That's why I remember when I was a kid, when I was growing up and going to the Roman Catholic Church, and I come out of church, my, my parents or my grandmother would say, don't, don't spit on the floor, you gotta, don't, don't spit on the ground for at least an hour if you take the communion, because if you spit on the ground, it's like spitting God out of your mouth. And whether, whether, whether the Roman Catholics are, are consciously aware of it or not, yet this is exactly the whole th thrust behind Roman Catholic teaching. Everything about the Mass centers on that Eucharist, when supposedly they believe that Jesus Christ comes into that Eucharist, physically and literally, not symbolic. It's not some, you know, it's not some symbolic thing that they're doing. I don't know where they pick it up. Where they, some people say, well, he's, he's just doing a... No, he's literally physically taking it out of heaven. That's what they believe. And this whole doctrine of trans, trans You know what the doctrine is? trans Trans, meaning that it's moving from one place to another. 
So the whole understanding gives is that they actually are moving Christ from the throne of heaven into the Eucharist so that it can be received into the people. So that Christ can be received into the people through that Eucharist. The whole... Now think of that. The whole mass centers around that one, that one moment when he pulls Christ down out of heaven. The whole mass. Everything. Everything that the, everything that the, the priest does in the mass... And the Mass in and of itself is an abomination. Because the Mass is supposed to be the sacrifice of Christ. And the Bible tells us, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 28, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Once. And yet every time people go to the Roman Catholic Mass, they are sacrificing that Christ over and over and over again. That's, what the, that's why it's called the sacrifice of the Mass for, because that's exactly what it is. It's a sacrifice. They're sacrificing Christ anew, afresh, every single time, because He hasn't got to be pulled out of heaven. Now there's more to this than meets the eye. Let me read you something uh, what the Council of Trent defined the communion table. It, it, this is what they say, and I, I just read this to you. If anyone denies that in the sacrament of the most holy Eucharist are contained truly, really, and substantially the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at that. I mean, they really underlined it. Without no, without no comments on soul, divinity, everything. Body, soul, and spirit. Everything is contained in that Eucharist. And then they turn around and call us crazy when we invite Christ into our hearts. It takes enough faith to believe that Christ is in that Eucharist. That's why the whole Mass is all about. He says, and consequently the whole Christ, the whole Christ is in that Eucharist. Not just a part of Him, not just some of Him, but the whole entire Christ, the whole divinity of Christ, the whole body, the physical body of Jesus Christ, the soul of Jesus Christ. The priest now has got the power to pull the entire Christ out from the throne of heaven and put Him into that cookie. Why do you think they parade around in the streets with that thing called the monstrance? It's a sunburst thing with the Eucharist in the middle. They're actually parading Jesus around. That's where they believe Jesus is manifested. They actually believe that Jesus is manifested through the Eucharist. The Eucharist without a Eucharist, you can't have a Mass. Without the Eucharist, you can't have the priesthood of the, of the Roman Catholic Church. Without the Eucharist, you can't have no sacraments. The Eucharist is the center for everything that they do around the Roman Catholic Church. The Eucharist is the center for it all. Everything about the Mass, everything about the ceremonies that they do, it, the, the center of it is that Eucharist. When you take that Eucharist away, and the whole Mass, the whole priesthood, the whole sacrifice of the Mass, everything that they do falls apart. Everything. The sacraments, everything falls apart. You take that Eucharist away. Because they believe that Eucharist, physically, literally, in the entire divinity and body and soul and spirit of Jesus Christ is in that cracker, is in that thing. Now they also said, they also, the, uh, the Council of Trent also said this, they said that if anyone does not believe this, let him be anathema. Meaning if you don't believe this, then you are cursed. You, got, you have a curse on you if you don't believe you're anathema, meaning you're excommunicated from the church. If you don't really believe that Jesus Christ is holy physically in that Eucharist and that the priest has got the power to pull Christ out of heaven and put him into that cracker. And this was this what started the whole Spanish Inquisition with the Holy Office that butchered, killed, and tortured thousands of innocent people because that they did not they didn't they didn't believe that the Eucharist was the physical body of Jesus Christ. The whole the whole Spanish Inquisition was centered on that. They would burn you to the stake. Put you on a, if you didn't believe that that Eucharist was the whole divinity of Christ. Think of the deception that we were in. I, I can only speak for myself. I know that 80% of the, again, of the audience, of the congregation, of the people of God that are listening to me were raised up in Roman Catholic churches. Think of the deception. Think of the, the demonic powers that were working when we knew that Christ died for the sins of the world. We saw, we, saw, we saw a crucifix and knew that it was Jesus hanging on that cross for the sins of the world. That He was the Savior of the world. 
and yet we didn't even know him. What a greater deception could we possibly be in? What greater deception could the devil possibly have fabricated than to let us hear the name of Jesus? Because the Bible tells us that you ask in my name and everything would be done. Think of it, we heard the name of Jesus and yet we had no power at all. We didn't even know him, but were completely and totally lost in our sins, even though we knew that Jesus died for the sins of the world. The Catholic Encyclopedia says this, In the sacrament of the Eucharist, the substance of bread and wine do not remain. The substance of bread and wine do not remain in the sacrament of the Eucharist, but the entire substance of the bread is changed into the body of Christ. And the entire substance of wine is changed into His blood. I mean, that's what they teach. They teach it outwardly. They have no denial about that. And think of it. The whole, again, the whole Mass is worked on just, to, just in that one t space of time when he supposedly pulls Christ out of heaven. Look, look, do, do you have any idea what the priest does in the whole ceremony of the Mass? Listen to what he does. Listen, listen to the rhetoric and the religious nonsense that was fed to us constantly. I mean, how many masses did we go to, even, I mean, from growing up? And we don't even realize it, but every time we took that stupid thing into our mouths, there was actually witchcraft that was being worked on us. I'll explain this in just a moment. That the whole idea that that physical, that that Eucharist, can actually become Jesus Christ in the entire body of Christ, the entire physical body, is nothing but the teachings of paganism and witchcraft. I'll get into this in just a moment. But, but just take a look at what the priest goes through every time he conducts Mass in order to turn the Eucharist into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Look at this. He makes the sign of the cross 16 times. He turns towards the congregation six times. He lifts his eyes to heaven 11 times. Now he's trained to do all this. Exactly at the same moment that he's supposed to do it. He kisses the altar 8 times. He folds his hands 4 times. Now he does all this before he turns the, the Eucharist into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Does all, he's doing all this right now because he's, thinking, he's, he's working himself up, you see. This is all the witchcraft that's involved in this whole thing. He folds his hands four times. He strikes his breast ten times. He bows his head twenty-one times. He genuflects eight times. He bows his shoulders seven times. He blesses the altar with the sign of the cross thirty times. He lays his hands flat on the altar 29 times. He prays secretly 11 times, and he prays aloud 13 times, and then after all of this rhetoric, traditional religious nonsense, then he turns the, the bread and the wine into the physical body and blood of Jesus Christ. And we were fed this constantly. Now, to, to reveal to you that this is all witchcraft, uh, the, 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 the Bible shows us, look at Jeremiah please, chapter 44. Jeremiah chapter 44. Now this whole idea of that, that little piece of bread becoming becoming the, the, the physical bread and body of Jesus Christ is all rooted in, in, uh, in, in paganism and witchcraft and idolatry. And it all stems from what the priests of Baal used to do. Which is seen here, I hope I can find it, in Jeremiah chapter 44. And take a look at this, please, in one moment, in verse 3. 
It says, because of their wickedness, which they have committed to provoke me to anger, in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods. How many times does a priest go into that church and he's spraying the incense all over the place? Whom they knew not, neither they, ye or your father. See, but that's all the whole build up to turn that thing in. But, but take a look at this then, if you jump down to verse 19 in that same chapter. Jeremiah 44 and verse 19. Notice what they were doing. Notice what these idol worshippers were doing. In verse 19, and when we burned incense to the queen of heaven. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because that's what Mary is called. She's called the queen of heaven. Heaven. And poured out drink offerings unto her. Now look at this. Did we make her cakes to worship her? Now what were these cakes that they were making to worship her? Now was it the hostess cupcakes? I can guarantee you that. It wasn't the cake that you sit down around the, around the table and have coffee with. That's not the cake that they were making. The cake that they were making was actually what... The cake that they were making w w was, was what they actually believed to be the bread of the gods. Or the flesh of the gods. And that when they would eat the flesh of the gods, they would become just like the god that they ate. You're already familiar with this by the term of cannibalism. Have you heard of cannibalism? If you break the word cannibalism down, you want to find cannibal. Cannibal, cannibal, which has got to do with the worship of Bra Baal, and cannibal means priest of Baal. And what were the priests of Baal doing? They were making these cakes, and they were actually eating the flesh of the gods. It got really worse when they would offer up human sacrifice, and then actually eat the flesh of the person. It was all a part of it, whether it was a cake or whether it was the flesh of a human being, the whole concept was the same. To eat that flesh in order to become like the God that you eat. Cannibal. The priest of Baal. And it's all over, it's all over the, the ancient paganistic ceremonies. In ancient Babylon, a sacred meal of bread and wine was celebrated, the bread being the corn of the god Cyrus, and the wine for the god of Bacchus. Remember that? In the book of Ephesians, you should read it. He says, drink not, with, speaking about the wine, the, the celebrations of the wine feast with Bacchus. That's the reason why they were coming in drunk into the Corinthian church, because of the, 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 uh, the tradition of Bacchus, which was wine drinking, and they thought that it was, had to do with the worship of their gods. Priest of Baal. And it's all rooted in witchcraft. Every bit of it. That's why you hear so many times of the bleeding statues. And the crying statues. And then you have the, the, the Eucharist that bleeds. All witchcraft. And now where does it all get their power from? From right here. Right from this, right from this 44th chapter of the book of Jeremiah, where there actually were cannibalism taking place. Priests of Baals, eating the flesh of a god. And, and that whole ceremony brought the whole spirit of witchcraft. And that's why you see all the supernatural things going on in the church, even to this very day. Visions of Mary... All the things that are going on with, in Burn, in, with Bernadette, and they got these things that come on television, the vision of Fatima, people getting healed, over 20,000 people saw the vision of the sun. It's all witchcraft, but notice this, the power behind that whole thing is the Eucharist. The power behind the whole, all the paraphernalia and stuff that you see taking place in a Roman Catholic church, the power behind it is the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the power behind all that supernatural paraphernalia, paranormal stuff that goes on. The, why is the Eucharist for? Because they believe that they're actually eating the flesh of the God. And that's where the priests of Baal got all their strength from. Cannibalism. Hallelujah. And you always hear it going on, it's, uh, you know, especially during the times of Easter and holiday making. 
You always hear the Roman Catholic Church someplace, somewhere, you hear about some stone bleeding, some Eucharist bleeding, some vision of Mary, and then you got these little children having these visions and people are getting healed and uh, Mary appearing on the, uh, the, the, you know, on the, on the wall of some, some house someplace and goes on and, on and it's all witchcraft, but the pow behind it is the Eucharist. Alberto Rivera gives the testimony when he was back in Spain, when he was a priest. And this is in, back in Spain. He says, there was this one house where, everything, where, where seen, everything in the house was flying around. There was so much witchcraft taking place in one house. The, the, the chairs, the tables, the, the people in the house were flying around the room. Everything was, in, everything was flying around. The priest, the priest tried to get into the house and they were knocked clear out. One of them, I think, died. And of course they called Alberto up, because at that time he was like number one at the top of the chart. So they called him in, and guess what he did? He walked in with the Eucharist. He, he says he walks in with this Eucharist, with the monstrance, and the moment he gave the Eucharist to one of the girls that was in the room, everything stopped. That's why they, they parade that monstrance around, and they actually fall on the ground and worship it. They fall on the ground because, as far as they're concerned, that's God coming through the town right now. When that guy, when that priest walks through, that's what he's all dressed in white for. Just like the priests of Baal. And think of it, every time we took that stupid thing into our mouths, we were working witchcraft on ourselves. And even though we didn't realize it, or even believe it, or even know it, we were actually partaking of witchcraft and eating the flesh of a god. That's why we thought that by eating it, we received Jesus. God help us and God deliver us. And now you can understand just how, now these are strong demonic spirits that you do not play with. Now look at this, the power and the strength of those demonic spirits stay with us. And they're brought right into the church because of traditional religious stuff that we're taught and through ignorance. We're never taught. I can't, I can't understand for one minute why we would want to hold on to that kind of stuff. And yet people don't even realize the kind of demonic spirit. And the people of God need so much deliverance just in this one area here. And I trust that in this message, you'll start to get some deliverance and start to realize that, this, that that's much of the communion table that we celebrate on a monthly basis is rooted in the witchcraft that we partook of when we were in the Roman Catholic Church. That's how strong it is. Now very quickly, I just want to give you two pairs of scripture to show you that the whole sacrifice of the Mass is abomination because Christ died once, period. And what the Roman Catholic Mass does is that they sacrifice Him over and over and over again. That's why they got Him on a crucifix for, because that's where they want Him to stay. They want Him to stay on a cross. But then we get religious and we take him off the cross, but we still hold on to the cross. We still got the cross, but we don't got Jesus on the cross. We think that that's, that's all, it, it's still, it, again, it's, all, it's just giving the whole thing a facelift. That's all we're doing. You come here and you don't see no crosses. Because if you don't experience the cross, then carrying a cross around you is, will do nothing for you. <laughs> Look at this very quickly, Hebrews chapter 10, come on. I, I, I think that a lot of people are ignorant. Concerned. Now, 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 you know what we do? We come into the church, we get saved. Oh, I, I used to do that. It's gone now. Now, now. now I know Christ. I don't do that anymore. Now it's become symbolic. And you don't realize those demons ain't going to run away. And that demonic stuff just ain't going to leave you just because you say it's symbolic. When you took that Eucharist in your mouth, you were receiving demon spirits. Think of that. Witchcraft was actually at work. Why do you think it's so hard for Roman Catholics to come to Christ? Why? Why is it that you think that people say, I I'm a Roman Catholic, I was born this way and I'll die this way. Why is it that you can be in the midst of Roman Catholic people, they haven't gone to church in years, and yet there's a wall there and you can never minister to them. Why? I know some people at work. We went to visit them at their house. 
And it's like God shut our mouths up. We couldn't say a word because of the tremendous demonic powers that are in people's lives. Just by being a Roman Catholic. You don't even have to go to church. Just by being a Roman Catholic. And saying, I'm Roman Catholic. Because this Eucharist, we don't realize that the, the demonic force behind the whole Roman Catholic Church, most of the power, because the Roman Catholic Church has got a lot of other things up its sleeve. But the Mass, the whole Roman Catholic Church, the Mass of it is the Eucharist. And that's how the demons get inside of people. That's how the demons get into, and, and, and when I say demons, I mean spirits of darkness get into people. That you, they ju just can't hear the gospel. And when it says that by grace we're saved, I want to tell you something, it was really a work of grace. How in the world we ever got saved? It had to be grace. Because with all of the spirits that we picked up, with all of the stuff that was put inside of us, it had to be a work of God that, that brought us out and had saved us, thinking all the while, why should I receive Jesus into my heart when I go to Mass every week and receive Jesus in my mouth? Why receive Jesus into your heart when you're receiving Him every week and eating Him every week too? And this is the reason why people are ignorant. Now look at this very quickly, Hebrews chapter 10 before I move on to the next points. Now think of that. That thing was established in, in, in 1545. 1545. It took them 1500 years to realize that Christ could come out of heaven and go into a cookie. But they did it. You know why? Because it's all Babylonian. Every bit of it. It's all Babylonian. Oh, by the way, I figured I'll just throw this in for good measure. Do you know that when the colonists came to America and anybody was caught celebrating Christmas, they were thrown in jail and fined five shillings. Did you know that? Because they recognized that Christmas was a papal holiday. That was in Massachusetts. They'd actually throw you in jail and fine you five shillings if you were caught celebrating Christmas. Because they knew that it was a papal holiday. We, we don't realize how the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church deteriorated and, and has penetrated our country in America and has penetrated the Constitution of the United States because Christianity in America is no longer people holding up a Bible and preaching the Word of God. Now it's Roman Catholicism. Take a look at this, please. Hebrews chapter 10. Isn't it? That's how they portray it in the movies. The Christian is always a Roman Catholic priest, isn't he? And then, and then the guy that's holding a Bible, he's strangling grandma up in the attic someplace. But the Roman Catholic priest, he's the, he's the pure one, he's the holy one. Lying devils. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, and look at verse 12. But this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. He offered one sacrifice, and he sits at the right hand of God, and he doesn't come off his throne to come into a cracker or into a piece of cake. See what it says there? Offered one sacrifice, and he sits at the right hand. He doesn't come off of his throne every time the priest holds up that, that piece of bread. My Bible tells me he sits there. Jump down to verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. One offering, not again and again and again like the Mass portrays. But by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. He only had to die once, not again and again and again like we did when we went to the Mass, because that's exactly what it's called the sacrifice of the Mass. Now, let me. Take you to the next level, the symbolic accounts, which is practiced by most Pentecostals and most saved people. 